Marianne Denton. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I am very excited to speak with you today and uh, have a conversation. I'm equally as excited as you are. Uh, Marianne, we first met on Twitter and uh, it's been so much fun learning about you and about the kind of work that you do. Uh, it's my understanding that you are an aquatic ecologist. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, so what exactly do you do as an aquatic ecologist? Well, my position with a state agency is to look at how benthic macroinvertebrates, and so benthic macroinvertebrates are the invertebrates that live on the bottom, um, benthic means bottom, of streams, rivers, and ponds. And um, there's a variety of in invertebrates. Some are insect larvae, others might be snails, worms, clams, crayfish. And all of these can tell a really interesting story about water quality. So some aquatic ecologists, when I think of ecology, to me, that's looking at the whole system. So I'm looking at the biological, the physical, and the chemical conditions that contribute to water quality in streams and ponds and lakes around my state of Nevada. Okay. Can you give me some idea of what determines good water quality? Well, when we're looking at the benthic macroinvertebrates, and I'm just going to say bugs for default, so I'm not always tripping over it. When we look at those, some um, invertebrates, especially invertebrates that are insect larvae, are really intolerant to disturbed conditions or warmed conditions or uh, conditions that have a lot of nutrients. So some mayflies. Um, can only have a very narrow range where they can live. Uh, the gills of mayfly larvae are on their abdomen. So fresh, cold water needs to be running over those gills all the time. There can't be like a lot of sedimentation because that will clog the gills. Uh, so like a high mountain stream or a stream that's pretty pristine, not touched by a lot of like a human condition, you'll find a really great sweet of benthic invertebrates that have a narrow range of what they can tolerate. Then some places um, you can go where there's been a lot of modification or a lot of human disturbance or it's warmer. And you there you might find things like planaria who love warm temperatures and low oxygen in the water, uh, crayfish, uh, invasive snails, things like that. So uh, the benthic invertebrates definitely tell a story about the stream, and we get them during the summertime. So it is a snapshot in time, but because they really can't go anywhere, uh, they tell us that something's happened. For example, if I went to a nice mountain stream and took a sample and there was nothing there, I would go, what happened here? So I would look at some of the other indicators I took when I was sampling, the physical indicators or the chemical indicators, um, things like that. So sometimes we expect to see the bugs there, and we do. And sometimes when we expect to see them, we don't. And that's when we investigate further what may be going on with water quality. You mentioned the planaria, which is one of my favorite creatures. Uh, actually, I'm a big nerd, so I collected some pond samples early in the spring and uh, early summer, and I have a uh, planaria that's been living in a jar for months and months. I've had to do exactly nothing to take care of it. Uh, it's my understanding that planaria, they kind of look like little worms. I guess we could describe them as, as are they a type of worm? You know, when we think of worms, um, and some people call them flatworms uh, because they are flat, but generally worms are segmented. So when you think of like an earthworm that you might put on a fishing hook or dig up in your garden, there are um, annelids which are in the aquatic environment as well that look just like the earthworms that you find anywhere else. And even though planaria are called flatworms, uh, they are, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm pretty convinced that, that they are in just their own order, that they're not specifically um, tied to the worm phylum per se. Okay. I do, 
I do believe, though, that they, if you see a lot of planaria, that's usually an indication of kind of um, grimy water environment, isn't it? it? It really can be, yes. So they do like it when uh, the, the water quality has gone down or it's been very warm or low oxygen. Um, and so today I was out at a wetland and it's really an urban wetland that has been modified and channelized. And um, there's a lot of planaria in there and a stream moves through it for the most part. There's a lot of planaria that's in there but the water is very clear, but it's very warm and it's very low oxygen. So that's why your planaria does so well in your jar without any care whatsoever, because it just doesn't need it. And for example, we have a, a river that runs through uh, the Reno area, the Truckee River, and the Truckee River runs out of the mountains. So it's nice, cold, clean water, and it's going to run about 70 miles to a terminal lake called Pyramid Lake. Well, way back when, uh, in the great infrastructure drive of America, a dam was put on the Truckee River to divert water to an agricultural area. So the dam is not holding water back all the time, only during the growing season. So below the dam, when the water is moving through and going all the way down to Pyramid Lake, you have a really good expected invertebrate community. But once they sort of um, use the dam to divert water to the agriculture area and it doesn't go down to Pyramid Lake, you get a ton of planaria because the conditions are so poor where you used to see benthic invertebrates like mayflies and stoneflies. You're just going to see a bunch of planaria because they like it so well. Okay, that, that makes a lot more sense for me. You're an ecologist. So how do you feel about people like me who sometimes go into streams and take little jar samples and, and keep the creatures, you know, in, in their house. Is that, is that really bad thing to do for the environment? Is it okay in, in small amounts? Well, what you are know, you feeling about that? I think that if you were taking a sample and I do the same thing myself all the time, just to keep myself entertained. So when I take samples for work, that's completely different. Those are going to be professionally identified. But sometimes I'll stop at a pond, I might pull up some roots or some vegetation, some algae, and just bring it home to look underneath the microscope. So I think that bits of it is fine, um, especially if you were in a place where perhaps you knew that there was a endangered species there. And usually here in Nevada, we have um, an endangered uh, water bug. And it is down in an area where there's been a lot of historic groundwater pumping. And so this um, true bug, it's a, it's a true bug that lives in the water, it really lost a lot of its habitat. So right now it's in a protected area. There's signs all over the place. It's really hard for me because I want to get off the boardwalk. I want to stick my hands in the water. But the signs all over place are very educational, they're very informative, but they tell me that this is a protected habitat. So I think when you and I go down to the stream or park pond and take a little sample, that's not hurting the environment. In my mind, being able to use that educationally to show people the variety of life and biodiversity just in ponds and streams through the microscope the educational value that helps people care about things they don't know about is worth taking the the tiny, you know, 40 milliliter sample of pond water. Yeah, that, that's that been my, my line of thinking too. You know, at first I was very, um, I was debating it, you know, should I do this? Should I not be doing this? But then I came to realize that, you know, when I started getting letters from high school science teachers saying, can I use this video? You know, in my class, uh, you know, especially with the pandemic, uh, it has become a very valuable source of information and, and education. You're totally right on that. Uh, I was curious, do you have any favorite creatures? I do have a ton of favorite creatures. And there's creatures that are not necessarily my favorite that I like to look at in any ways. Um, 
in terms of like being in a stream in uh, a stream or a river, there are particular species of stoneflies that I just love. And I love to see them when they're in their larval form in a river. They're nice and they're big and people go, oh, they're ugly, but I think they're gorgeous. And then when they, after they've lived in the stream for up to two years and it's the weather's right and the timing's right and they crawl out of the stream and emerge as an adult, they're even more beautiful or differently beautiful. So I think stoneflies are one of my big favorites. And I'm a huge, huge fan of dragonflies, both in their larval nymph stage and also in their um, adult stage. Uh, they're, they're such cool animals. You wouldn't even know that by just looking at your Twitter account, now, would you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so people who, uh, who aren't following Marianne on Twitter. Twitter um, Marianne, can you give us your, your Twitter account? Yes, it's um, at astro underscore limno. So astro for space and limno for limnology, L-I-M-N-O. Perfect. Thank you. So Marianne does tend to post a lot of pictures of dragonflies. What's so special about the dragonfly? You know, both in their larval form and their adult form, they're just fantastic predators. And I think that some people get this sort of magical fairy kind of type feeling with dragonflies. I know it means a lot to people to put them in a fairy tale belief kind of thing. And that's great because uh, it helps them care about dragonflies. But when I see a dragonfly, I'm seeing a predator that's going to take just about anything out of the air or in the water uh, when they're in their larval form. Dragonfly um, nymphs will eat tadpoles, small fish, other invertebrates, each other. And then when they are uh, terrestrial after they've emerged and they're terrestrial, they're just fantastic predators. And I love their eyes. Um, so I don't see them as a good omen or a symbol of uh, good fortune. I just see them as this very interesting predator that's got this fantastic wing mechanics. Um, and they're very, I have found that they're very interested in humans. I mean, so often I've had dragonflies. It feels like they're checking me out. And sometimes I feel, and here I'm doing just what I criticized a moment ago, if dragonflies were our size, I don't think they'd hesitate to try to take us out. I think if a dragonfly could eat us, they definitely would. Um, can we talk about dragonfly sex for a second? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we, had a, we had a conversation at great length about this a while ago, but uh, I remember you explaining to me dragonfly sex and I was completely astounded. So tell me a little bit about how it works and why it's so, I guess we'll, we'll call it unique. So, oh, good. So dragonflies and damselflies. So dragonfly and damselflies are um, odonata. And then there's two uh, subclasses, uh, dragonflies and damselflies, that come under uh, the class odonata and, um, or the, the, pardon me, the order odonata. And when dragonflies have sex, uh, sometimes females will play dead. Uh, just to avoid reproducing, um, mating. So uh, the males are very territorial. They will try to snatch a female from another male and they will hold on to a female pretty tightly. And if a female has mated already with another male, if a new male comes along and um, mates with her, he, he wants to get rid of the previous male's sperm. So he has a special appendage. And I know that there's a formal scientific name for it, but I call it a scupula. And that scoops out any previous male's sperm before the current mate uh, deposits his sperm to the female. So it's, you know, genetic evolution. That is the purpose of fitness is to pass on your genes. And so that's how they do that. So they also hold on to the female frequently when they are, um, after they've mated and when she's ovipositing, he will hold on to her while she lays her eggs. 
So no other male can get to her um, until she's finished laying her eggs. So as you can definitely tell, some of the more um, longer adult-lived dragonflies, uh, especially during mating season, because the females' wings will be kind of beat up, and and they'll they will come at each other again. The males can be very territorial, or they'll even try to snatch the females away from another male. And sometimes the females are like, "That's it, I'm playing dead," and they just drop to the ground because I. Every time, every time I hear that story, I mean, it literally, it's mind blowing to me how nature works. And in particular, how, uh, you know, the male female dynamic in this particular creature works. Is this something that do you know if any other creatures have that kind of I mean, m males compete in almost, I think, in, in most um, animals, in, the males compete for for mating, but I don't know of any other a creature that can actually take away the other male's sperm. I don't either. Um, I definitely do not know that. Now, I what I do know, and I'm not going to get this perfect, but slugs, some sea slugs and some terrestrial slugs have detachable penises. Um, and there we go. It's, it's that song, right? <laughs> you're laughing because you're thinking that song. Um, but yes, they have, um, uh, a de pat, de pat, detachable penis that they'll just throw at the female. Um, sorry, and, repeat that. They, so male, male slugs have a detachable penis that they throw at the female. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, I think, and again, I'm not getting it perfectly, but yes, they are able to, sometimes it's called a um, nuptial package. Uh, the spiders, I believe, give female spiders the nuptial package, which is pretty much uh, their sperm in terms of uh, 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 giving them the package. And then the person who knows so much about this is um, Maureen Berg. And, but they, that's that's one of our selling points for Team Inver is detachable penis that slugs can detach their repro reproductive organ and give it to their mate. They do this after copulating? I'm not sure. I think it okay. can be. Yeah, it's not so much like, hey, we're done. Take this with you. Parting gift. It's 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 how she gets this gets the sperm, gets the genetic package. Oh fascinating mm -hmm. i did definitely did not know that yes and like like i said i'm giving a really superficial superficial uh, view of the detachable penis but it <laughs> sounds i mean it sounds fantastic right uh that you're able to have these different um strategies of reproduction and how did those strategies evolve to maximize evolutionary fitness is just fantastic. Yeah, it's definitely something that fills you with a sense of wonder. Uh, and I can understand why, you know, so many books are written and children's books are written about bugs. And I think more and more we're starting to move away from, you know, the fear of bugs to like really understanding uh, how, how diverse they are and how interesting they are. And and I think that's thanks to, you know, social media and Twitter and YouTube. Now you can, you know, kids can watch videos about spiders and not be scared of them, etc. Uh, you mentioned Maureen and Invertifest. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, I know that that's a Twitter event. I did interview Kelly Brenner. So we spoke about it a little bit, but you're also a part of that, aren't you? Well, I was one of the curators this last Invert Fest, and so Maureen, Franz, and uh, Kelly do run the account, and they decide randomly, I don't know if they have any particular uh, purpose when they decide to have uh, Invert Fest, but this year they decided to have interviews with other um, people who were invertebrate enthusiasts, and then had different people uh, curating the account over four days before the three days of the full on post your pictures, put the hashtag. Um, so, but it's, it is a great way to raise awareness. And I think like you mentioned that Twitter is a really great place to connect with 
a lot of different invertebrate ecologists or taxonomists. And for what I'm thinking of uh, recently, I connected with a woman and she said that her, so she's on Twitter. So this is public. She said that her uh, son uh, is autistic and, but he loves spiders. And she was looking to bring more spiders into his life. And science Twitter and spider Twitter just responded within, I, I think I may have connected with her Friday. And again, the, these especially spider specialists have just sent her videos and pictures of different spiders. And he is overjoyed. He is obsessed with spiders and it's it's how he stims his happy stim um but he loves the spiders and because of the connection of science twitter spider twitter and she just put it out there now she has this great community who is able to interact with her son with you know she's a buffer i sent her three spider pictures today through direct message and her son's getting this and I think it says a couple things. One, that science Twitter and invertebrate Twitter is just the best team invert. Um, that people like you and I can connect with this mother and her son and help him appreciate the natural natural world. Give him something that his mother has a totally different set of gifts that is meant for him, but now we can share with him uh things that really interest him and i think when we're able to share that stuff with each other it gives people even if you're uh um a six-year-old autistic boy or if you're me it gives us a sense of value and we feel valued and we feel part of a community even though it's you know digital there's a value and a community there and that's really one of the great things about um team hashtag team invert or invert fest is that it is showing this beautiful diversity of insects and worms marine invertebrates freshwater invertebrates um all over the the world to share this and um i think it's just it feels really good it feels like a good community and we don't we don't get we don't get bitchy with each other yeah if, if somebody has a um, misidentification, I misidentify things because uh, I'm not a taxonomist. I look at community interactions. But if I misidentify something, somebody can pop in and say, hey, I think that that is that. And I go, great. So they don't do it in an insulting way. Uh, where sometimes you'll see in other Twitter genres or other science Twitter genres, people can can get really very uh, territorial, I think, about what their research is. And I just never get that with invert Twitter. Yeah, it's something that's very, very unique about the science community on Twitter. And I experienced this personally as well as someone who, you know, I'm someone who's dropped out of university seven times. So, I mean, I only have a high school education on paper. Um, I'm, you know, I, I was pretty, I came in on uh, Twitter as a tiny world. That was my science project there. And people just started connecting with me and identifying the creatures that I was posting. Because I, half the time, have no idea what I'm looking at. And all of a sudden, I started getting people with PhDs and people who work as scientists and people who are grad students. Everybody's just started coming in and and helping me identify what I was looking at. I was like, oh my God, that has never happened in all of my experiences with other groups, whether it's the arts or the IT world or whatever. This is so incredibly unique. And so I've been really, really grateful to everyone I've met on Science Twitter. And I always, you know, I advise people, whether it's a mom of, of a young autistic boy, or, you know, uh, if you're a mature student or you're you're just a teenager, you can go on Twitter and connect with people who have, you know, expertise and they will welcome it. That's what's beautiful about science Twitter. Yes, absolutely agree. I've made connections 
on uh, science Twitter that I never thought I would make in my life. And some of these connections have definitely turned into uh, real life friendships. Uh, Kelly Brenner, uh, I visited her last November and was actually going to go to Seattle in April for her um, book opening, but then COVID came along. So the, the connections I've made in Twitter have really enriched my life. And I think that you need to draw boundaries. You need to know what's appropriate. And sometimes I've had to do that with some people. And I think some of the larger accounts uh, definitely get people who either criticize them or creeping on them, what have you. So as long as you know your boundaries and how to uh, moderate yourself and your time with people, it can be fantastic and you can develop really great relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why, again, I just tell people, especially because I've been trying to get more people to look at um, the micro microscopic life under microscopes at home. You know, if you don't know what it is, post it on Twitter. Somebody's going to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And speaking of education, actually, Marianne, I do know that uh, you went back to school to study science and you were a mature student. How old were you when you decided to study science? Well, I always, always loved science. And I remember in seventh grade wanting to teach biology. Uh, but not everybody's uh, growing up and maturing through middle school, high school is particularly nurturing or very good at guidance in terms of how you determine a career. And again, I always loved science. It always meant something to me. My fifth grade teacher showed us a drop of pond water and I was fascinated. And I think a lot of the reason that I felt drawn to science was become a, because of him. And in my mind, it was something that you would do for my class, my socioeconomic class, that if you loved science, you would become a science teacher. Because in my mind, becoming a scientist was the realm of the elite, the Ivy League. Nobody ever told me differently. And I wasn't particularly motiva motivated to find out. So I had been taking uh, community college classes just to make myself a better administrative person, administrative assistant, executive assistant person. And then when my husband and I got married, my husband said, could you just go to school full time and do what you love? And I'm like, be a biologist? Are you serious? And, and, and even then at that point, I was thinking that I want to teach high school science and math. And I was probably 34, 35 when I started going to school full time, both sort of in between community college and university. Uh, community college classes are less expensive and, and transfer to the university. So I did a lot of them at community college, which was more comfortable because it is other non-traditional students. And then when I transferred to the university, definitely surrounded by people who were much younger, um, many of them just straight out of high school, straight to university. Uh, so it was interesting being a more mature student. I think the things that I definitely brought as a mature student was that I knew how to be organized and how to get things done. Um, I knew how to do great research, even though I hadn't been in school from being in the business world, I knew how to do research. So those were some gifts that I took into um, being a mature student that somebody out of high school doesn't have. But it does feel weird. It, it can feel a little bit weird. I think it's less weird when you're in grad school as a mature student than when you're an undergrad as a mature student. So if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You actually took my next question right out of my mouth, which was, what does a mature student bring to the table? But you're right. I mean, when you're in your 30s, you have so much more self-awareness of who you are as well, don't you find? Yes, mm -hmm. you do. And I think that it is, everybody's feelings can get hurt. There were a couple times in undergrad and grad school where my feelings kind of got hurt as a more mature student felt 
either people didn't take the opportunity to get to know me, so I felt judged, or people took advantage of me. It's one thing I learned pretty quickly. Um, I actually hate group projects. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it is, again, you know, you do bring things, but there are also challenges. And to be honest, uh, being in your mid thirties, you, I don't know if this is official clinical documentation. I just don't think you have the brain plasticity as you do when you're late teen, early twenties. Yeah. It's, it's something that I wish I, you know, I try going back to university over and over and over again. It just, it, it, I wasn't there yet. I didn't have, like you said, that maturity. I think looking back, if I had, you know, maybe um, changed my mind, maybe in my thirties, I would have gone back to school. I'm happy with the, the choice of not going back to school. But what I do now is, you know, one of the things I started doing about 20 years ago is I interview my cab drivers and my Uber drivers. I love, I love conversation. And I ask um, Uber drivers very often, you know, what would you do if you could do anything? If you weren't driving an Uber or, you know, working at your dad's automobile shop, what would you actually do? And a lot of them have a career in mind. And a lot of them say, oh, but yeah, but I, you know, I'm in, I'm in my 30s. I, I would have to go back to school. And I say, you know what? Go back to school, man. Yeah, absolutely. And that's funny because I love to do that too. I love to have random casual conversations, especially uh, as with Uber drivers or taxi drivers. And it's never too late to go back to school. And when I was an undergrad, there was a woman who was in her early 60s there getting her uh, biology undergrad like me. And she graduated. Uh, with honors and actually went on to medical school. And I think, wow, that was impressive that she was in her early sixties. And so she was uh, 30 years older than me at that point and was willing to go through the rigor of going to medical school and, um, you know, graduate school, especially PhD. And I'm sure a medical program is just has to be, trying very very uh uh trying and difficult to accomplish so but i think that when somebody does have a goal and they have somebody that can help them coach them uh tell even even when i was in school i took too many of the wrong credits uh i took too many credits in community college that didn't transfer over to university things that people didn't even coach me on. So I think if you have a good coach, a good academic advisor who can help, especially a mature student, it would be great. It would be fantastic if universities had an academic advisor for mature students to help them navigate a really different type of um, circumstance. So you can go from the driver's seat of an Uber to a glass classroom seat in genetics, something like that, that help them understand the skills that they'll need, that they've got great skills, but here's some other skills that you will need. That's a very, very good point. I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think some Canadian universities have somebody in that role. I could be wrong. I think it's the same person that usually handles student co-ops, but again, I could be wrong on that, but that's a very good point to make. Now, because you were a mature student, you know the value of lifelong learning. I was curious about uh, the kind of science education that you do. I know that you have led lectures, correct? I think you speak to uh, the general public on uh, science. I do. And you mentioned your videos and I contacted you early on uh, in, I think that was in February or January, uh, to use some of your tardigrade videos. So public engagement is super important to me. and right now there seems to be in america uh, a really big decline in science literacy and there's a saying that you can't care about what you don't know about and so i've given a presentation at professional societies about specifically talking to children going to classrooms so i will do public lectures at um 
naturalist centers or planetariums. Um, I will also do guided hikes uh, for a local conservation organization. And anytime any teacher asks me to come to their classroom or come to science night, I will be there. Because when we help children think critically about things and think about the processes and help them care about something that they may not have known about, especially a lot of people don't know about uh, benthic macroinvertebrates because they haven't seen them or they don't understand them. I think it helps them analyze things elsewhere and helps them think critically so they can question something they might hear and go, does this sound reasonable? Is this true? Is this something I can believe in and is the evidence there rather than just accepting something uh, that somebody told them. And, and one of the things I definitely say is children should always trust their parents to have their best interests at heart. And I'm never looking to undermine parents, but as children, they remember things. They absolutely remember things. And they remember the people they meet when they're in middle school uh, when they're in elementary school, and they take that on because you see the stories. I remember meeting so and so, and it inspired me to do this. Um, so again, I think it helps them realize that they too could be an aquatic ecologist like me. I do go to one school that we call at risk, um, where it's uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged. And I, I make a point of going to those schools first as much as I can. And when I get my thank you notes, I work with this one particular teacher frequently. When I, He makes them write thank you notes. He makes them take notes. And then when I get the thank you notes, it's great because they always write about something I talked about. And one of them wrote, I really want to do what you do and I'm going to study to do it. And so this is like a fifth grader. And I wonder if I'd had someone at that point, knowing that I had this just sense of adventure and exploration in my heart, if somebody like that could have encouraged me to do it, and I didn't see science as being this elite um, uh, class for only people who are almost sort of like born into science, born into being a doctor's daughter becomes a doctor herself, something like that. Um, so yes, I'd love to do public outreach. I, I call them up and I'm, I just volunteer. I said, I'd love to come talk to your group. Uh, we have a local observatory in uh, about 30 miles south of where I live and they have Saturday night star parties. And so they have a speaker and they can talk about anything. And so I've given my tardigrade talk there. I've given a dragonfly talk there, and I've also given an astrobiology talk there. And then they pull out the telescope. So I get to meet people from the community. They get to ask questions about what I'm talking about. And every one of us can do this. We all have a gift. And I know people hate public speaking, and it's tough, but we all have a gift we can share. And so I love talking to people, um, especially before it starts. I go through the audience, and I, I introduce myself to everybody. And it makes it a comfortable conversation. I want to have a conversation. Yeah, you science. mentioned you mentioned science literacy, and and you you know you just uh, spoke a lot about children. I'm curious about uh, speaking to people who are older than than children, so like grown ups or teenagers or people who are you know aren't necessarily in the the schooling system, or you know some of them are. Uh, a lot on Facebook and sharing all sorts of memes and stuff. How do you uh, how do you communicate science to the general adult population that might be actually vulnerable to you know misinformation? Uh, that's a, a good point. And one of the things I know is that if somebody's coming to one of my lectures, they're open to learning. They're absolutely they're coming to a public engagement. They're absolutely open to learning. And so we can have a conversation that way. In terms of outside of uh, that sort of format, I will say there have been times where I'm not quite sure if I want to use 
the term clash uh, can happen. Um, here, here's an example. Uh, about six years, I had this very, uh, six years ago, I had a very rare sarcoma. And a sarcoma is just like a cancer, but it's of the connective tissues. Um, so it's, it's, it's different, but the same. And it's treated by an oncologist. So I had this sarcoma and the people who came out to tell me about the alkaline diet, or um, maybe I needed to take high doses of curcumin and things like that. And one woman, um, who I've known for a very long time, I, I, I told her, I said, you know, I know that you're doing this out of the kindness of your heart, but you have to know that I put my faith in modern medicine and these sort of ideas are harmful. So no, the alkaline diet, you cannot change your blood chemistry. And I've even had to tell other scientists, peers of mine who from work, who had a sister who was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she goes, well, I really thinking about talking to her about the alkaline diet. And I had to calm down and not scream because the inside of my head is screaming and say, you can't change your, your blood chemistry like that. An alkaline diet will not cure your sister of breast cancer. What will cure her is surgery and whatever treatment that her oncologist chooses for her, which can be pretty horrendous treatment. It could be radiation therapy. I had radiation therapy. It could be chemotherapy. Chemotherapy doesn't work very well on sarcomas, especially the type of sarcoma I had, which was great because I didn't have to have it. But to talk to adults, and it usually tends to be more in that realm. Um, if people argue with me on Facebook or on Twitter, I have a, a a three tweet rule. And then I just don't respond. Uh, so I generally don't socialize with anybody who has ideas that are outside of the norm of accepted rational thinking, but there are a lot of people out there and I will try to speak with them kindly. And then sometimes some people I've actually just had to say to myself, I can't have that person in my life because their thoughts are harmful, their suggestions are harmful, their suggestions could harm other people. Uh, can the, the one woman who suggested I get on the alkaline diet when I had my sarcoma told me, she goes, my father's melanoma's come back and he's going to go on the alkaline diet. And I just wrote to her and I said, melanoma is nothing to mess around with. You don't, you don't take the alkaline diet for melanoma. Um, and you know, I don't know what the outcome was, but usually depending on how somebody presented to me, I just try to be gentle and say, you know, this is what I believe. And this is what I trust. And I try not to criticize that person, but I can say, this is why I don't trust what you're saying. And here's what the evidence about that is. And some people, they just won't buy it. At all. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, the astrophysicist uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, said one uh, one of the smartest things I've ever heard, which is, um, you know, if somebody tries to argue with him about whether the Earth is round or flat or whatever, he asks those people one question, which is, is there anything I can say that could change your mind? And if the answer is no, he walks away. So, you know, it's one of those things where you know, some people will believe things even if you present them with the, you know, the right evidence. Um, and speaking of astrophysics, why don't you tell me a little bit about your fascination with outer space? Ah, well, <laughs> I, I do love space. And it's very funny because uh, one of my... Uh, uh, goals, how I ended up with the the Twitter handle uh, Astro Limno underscore Limno was I had joked to a, another woman who was in grad school with me, who is now an astrobiologist. And I said, I want to be an astro limnologist because I know on Mars, you have a lot of um, ancient 
water bodies and lake beds and deltas. And she told me, she goes, well, yes, there are people who study space. So you have in, so in terms of the asteroid community, you have the planetary scientists who are going to study our solar system worlds, the moon in the solar system, our solar system planets, um, dwarf planets, other objects. Uh, you know, then you have astrophysicists or cosmologists, um, you know, cosmologists looking at the origin of the universe and how did it come about? Or maybe you're looking at star formation or supernovae or something like that. And so it's such a diverse thing. And so I really love astrobiology, which happens on Earth. I mean, astrobiology happens on Earth before it happens anywhere else. And solar system um, planetary oh. science. Hold on. Can you, can you tell me how, how that is? How does astrobiology happen on Earth? Well, one of the big ways how astrobiology happens on Earth is origin of life. We don't know how life got started on Earth. You've got a couple of competing hypotheses that you're able to apply out in our solar system. So one hypothesis is the um, hydrothermal vents, where you would get the hot water out, out of these hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, and that's going to... Um, perhaps cause uh, some mineralization that will lead to some polymers. Or you have the other one, um, Darwin's warm little pond, you have this wet dry hypothesis that early earth had um, a lot of little warm ponds that would dry out and get wet and dry out and get wet. And the drying process and the rewetting process allowed um, organic uh, molecules like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus to start developing these polymers of organic molecules, these chains, which eventually could lead to prebiotic uh, RNA and what have you. So how astrobiology happens here on Earth is we don't know how life started on Earth. We have a lot of locations on earth where life happens that couldn't happen anywhere else again the hydrothermal vents um hot springs like uh yellowstone and uh other hot springs where you have these um either um extremophiles in terms of bacteria that can uh, handle super high temperatures do their best there um, maybe they do really well in salt. Maybe they do, and these are all like bacteria that I'm thinking of. Maybe they do really well in very, um, arid cold environments. So Antarctica is considered an astrobiology place to study astrobiology. Uh, here in Nevada, there's actually a professor down in Las Vegas at the Desert Research Institute in Las Vegas, and he studies uh, cyanobacteria in the soils, the soil crust, the bio crust in the soils of the Mojave Desert, and the radiation resistant resistance that they have developed, and using that as a Mars analog. Uh, one of the big things cyanobacteria is cyanobacteria actually is why you and I live, and why most of um, well all. Uh, aerobic creatures live because cyanobacteria put oxygen into our atmosphere. And, and that's when we started developing aerobic respiration. But there's a lot of fossilized cyanobacteria, cyan fossilized stromolites, and other fossilized cyanobacteria are the oldest evidence of fossils on Earth. And so we're talking like two and a half billion years ago when there was the great oxidation event that all this oxygen came into the atmosphere and really changed Earth's system because of cyanobacteria. This is so, so I mean, this is so <laughs> mind blowing. Again, just like talking about dragonfly sex, yeah. the the idea of, you know, first of all, you know, extremophiles include 
creatures like tardigrades and rotifers and some of the stuff that I looked at under the microscope, but it never occurred to me to even think about bacteria. Oh, yes. And there's, there's even another domain and there's, so we have the um, eukaryotes, where you we are eukaryotic, meaning all of our cells have a nucleus and a membrane that holds our nucleus in. So we're eukaryotes. Um, bacteria are prokaryotes. And so that's two of these domains. And then so eukaryotes are going to be plants, mushrooms, uh, humans, worms. Um, but then there's another domain called archaea, which are like bacteria, but not quite. And usually you find these archaea in places that are hot springs, the deep thermal vents, the hot springs. Um, and they're pretty cool. How The reason I think they're cool is they're named after Norse gods, because the first place they found uh, these archaea was in a hydrothermal vent in the North Atlantic that they called Loki's Castle. So, <laughs> so cool. yeah, it's the pictures are pretty cool, and it just it looks like this crazy castle with all these um, hot water coming out. And then, so they have found other um, strains of archaea in Yellowstone uh, that's named. You know, they've got the, the Loki strain and the Thor strain. And uh, so it's kind of cool how they've named these strains of Archaea uh, after um, the the Norse gods based on the very first hydrothermal vents going, oh, this looks like Loki's castle. So, um, so yeah, so bacteria, and then you have the Archaea, and then you've got everybody else, us, the eukaryotes. Do you think, now take an educated guess. Uh... Do you think there's life outside of, you know, outside of Earth? I think that um, on Mars, so Mars had water uh, three and a half billion years ago, it had an extensive ocean, had uh, lakes, rivers, things like that, mainly in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Earth has a dynamo and that's what it spins. It's kind of... Um, it's what gives us our magnetic field. And the dynamo on Mars slowed down and, and pretty much stopped. So it lost its ability to hold on to the atmosphere. Um, and all the water, I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but it just boiled off, evaporated off. And there's still water on Mars, but they have giant ice sheets that are about two meters below the surface. Uh, there is a very salty lake at the South Pole. That's a kilometer below the ice cap. Um, so there's still water environments. I did read a paper about the photosynthetic potential on Mars. And so when you're thinking about photosynthetic, cyanobacteria is photosyn photosynthetic. Even though it's a bacteria, it has um, the chloroplast that does the photosynthesis. And so cyanobacteria is an analog organism for looking at life on Mars. So you have these rovers that are now going to Mars that are super cool. Uh, right now, Curiosity is in Gale Crater, which is this old ancient lake. Um, and it looks at, at soil samples and stuff like that. And then uh, Mars Perseverance, which just launched at, launched at the end of July and will land in Mars um, in February, and it's going to um, a crater called um, Jezero Crater, which has a delta coming into it. And so it's equipped with more instrumentation to look for things that might be more organic molecules than Curiosity. Um, and then also the European Space Agency is sending up a rover next year. And I love what they named her. They named her uh, the Rosalind Franklin. Ah, beautiful. Right. And that's an astrobiology um, rover as well. And I can't remember where that rover will land, but they're landing these rovers in places that were ancient lake beds, ancient deltas, which will give clues to whether or not there was life there. Now, when I first started thinking about like a 
I did think about doing a PhD in planetary science, but eh, I cooled off that idea. Um, and my thing was, uh, if there was water on Mars, then there's going to be diatom, uh, leftover diatom fossils on Mars. Well, I did not know it had been three and a half billion years that there had been, since there had been water on Mars. So I don't know. I don't think diatom fossils are going to last three and a half billion years. But who knows what the, these rovers will find? Uh, will they find active life? Likely not. Uh, there's uh, pure chlorates, perchlorate salts on Mars that most people think would make life inhabitable. But who knows? Who knows? We have life in the craziest places on Earth. So um, then also uh, Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, has a, it's a small moon, and it has a geysers that come out the south pole. When the Cassini probe that went to Saturn, and it's been almost three years since the Cassini mission ended, but the Cassini probe that went to Saturn and investigated Saturn and Saturn's moons, flew through the plume and found things that we would consider uh, the building blocks for larger organic molecules. A lot of the comets, they're able to determine what's on comets. Um, and those have different uh, organic molecules like um, acetone and things like that that contribute to the development of these long chain polymers. So Enceladus is a possibility for life because they found these sort of building block organic molecules in the plumes. Nothing saying life was there, but they found this kind of stuff. And then Titan, another moon of Saturn, is super cool. It's bigger than the planet Mercury. And the cool thing about Titan is they have uh, lakes. It has an atmosphere. It's got an a, a nitrogen-rich atmosphere uh, like Earth's, but we could not live there. But they have these lakes and seas in the northern hemisphere, but it's liquid methane. And it has a whole sort of cycle of evaporation and clouds and precipitation. So just how we have our hydrologic cycle here on Earth with water evaporating from the ocean and coming inland and dropping it down as rain or snow and it hits the rivers and then goes back to the ocean, what have you, they have the same thing on Titan, but with methane. And they are sending a mission to Titan. It will launch, ooh, I don't know when it launches, but it takes a long time to get out to Saturn. Uh, it will get there in 2034. And this mission is pretty cool. It won't go to any of the lakes. It's going to land in these sand dunes. And there's evidence that these sand dunes are really rich in organic material. When I say organic, I'm talking about carbon, carbon different um, compounds like methane or ethane or what have you, um, hydrocarbon compounds uh, where you take a carbon and you stick hydrogen on it. So Titan has all these organic compounds that they've detected on the surface. And this mission called Dragonfly is a quadcopter. So when it lands, it's got skids and it will be able to fly, I believe, up to five kilometers. Um, but it will fly around and take samples and send that in that telemetry back to the mission uh, uh, headquarters on Earth for the Dragonfly mission. So pretty cool things in looking at the prebiotic chemistry of life. Um, evidence of life both on Mars and with the Dragonfly uh, mission going to Titan. It's so awesome. Yeah, the next uh, 10 to 20 to 30 years, I think, are going to be pretty amazing. I, I would actually love to have you back on next year to when the Mars uh, missions are underway. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, Marianne, we just have a couple of minutes left. There, there is one thing I really wanted to bring up today, which was uh, your collection of dresses. I know that you have hundreds and hundreds of dresses. I find that really quirky, and I really like quirky people. So can you tell me just a little bit about your huge selection of dresses? How, how do you choose one? How, you know, tell me a little bit about that. You know, I, I do love my dresses, and most of my dresses are sundresses. And um, 
I do have a lot of them and it's almost a compulsion to buy them. I do have to control myself sometimes and I will buy them anywhere. I will buy them at boutiques. I will buy them at specialty shops. I will buy them at thrift stores. If I see a dress that I love, I, I generally will buy it. I have a lot of dresses with bugs and dragonflies on them too. Uh, so I love that. But I like to get dressed up and it helps me feel good. And so sometimes just putting on a sundress and doing my hair cute and uh, the makeup, I feel good. And I think when I feel good, I'm better for other people. And so putting on some of my dresses, my sundresses and stuff, especially my favorites, it's like wrapping myself in a warm blanket. It's very comforting. It, it feels comforting and good to me to wear my dresses. And so I do have a lot of them. Um, I try to only buy three a month. Um, so I know that seems like a lot to buy three dresses a month, especially during the summertime when sundresses are out. Uh, so if I see a style and I like it, um, I will buy it. If I've only worn it once and I haven't worn it in about six or seven years, I tend to redonate it. Or sometimes my husband will say, and I appreciate his honesty, that dress is not for you. <laughs> and I'm happy to to uh, donate it on because maybe it's not for me, but it could be perfect for somebody else. So, but it's a real comfort thing for me. Well, I have to admit, whenever I see a picture of you, you know, collecting samples in a stream and you're wearing a lovely sundress and you have a huge smile on your face, that, I mean, that just makes me smile. So I think it's very cool that <laughs> that you have a fun collection of dresses and that you take pictures in them. Uh, listen, Marianne, we have to wrap up. So I just wanted to say thank you for coming on the show, for helping me learn a lot more, not just uh, through this program, but also on Twitter, on social media. I think that your account is, uh, it's a fresh uh, change from all the vitriol online. And it's really nice to, to, uh, to connect with, with someone who also appreciates, you know, the, the tiny world that we live in. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you. I am so grateful that we've connected uh, on Twitter and chatting about other things as well. It's made my life better. And I really appreciate that you've given me this time to to talk today, um, to share what I love. And hopefully other people will go, oh, that's interesting. Or if they think I'm boring, that's okay, too. Uh, I'm all right with that. <laughs> well, hopefully you, we can do this again. Uh, like I said, maybe next year when uh... When the Mars rovers are exploring Mars, I think it would be fun to do. Oh, I'd love that. Yes. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne.